There's a huge hole in our ozone layer and we're all gonna die of skin cancer are the kind of headlines I remember reading about as a kid in the 80s and 90s. Ozone layer is being threatened as never before. We're all at risk. But fast forward to today, and you almost never hear about the ozone layer. So what happened? Did we figure it all out and problem solved? Are we all doomed and we just don't know it yet? Or something in the middle? That's what I wanted to talk about today. And what have we learned? And actually, stay tuned to the end when I'll give you my thoughts and analysis on what this means. There's some really interesting takeaways to this whole thing. Today, on am Da Vinci. This video is sponsored by Masterworks. Let's start by talking about how we got into this mess. The real culprit here, the ozone destructive substances like CFCs or chlorofluorocarbons. Now these started to see a rise in popularity in the 50s, 60s, 70s with things like aerosol cans, spray paint, for example, or hairspray. I get flashbacks of the 70s with the big hair movement and all the hairspray being used, but that was aerosols. Because it holds, because it holds, it holds. The second big culprit are refrigerants. Now these are the working fluid in things like refrigerators and air conditioning systems. So your car's AC, your home AC, refrigerators all have refrigerant. And back in the days, they used CFCs. And if these leaked out of your system, they wreaked havoc on the ozone layer. Now, before we talk about how exactly this destroys the ozone layer, let's talk about the two shields that we have that make life on earth really pleasant and lovely. The first is the magnetosphere. So the magnetosphere is a magnetic field that surrounds the earth and protects it from solar winds. Okay. If you look here down at this diagram from NASA, you can see what it's doing. This is deflecting the mag all the charged particles that are coming off the sun. And as a result, our planet stays safe. Planets that don't have a magnetosphere get bombarded by these charged particles and it does a lot of damage to both the atmosphere and also to living organisms on the surface. Now this is really important because while other planets like Saturn, Mercury, Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune have magnetospheres, the Earth has the largest of any terrestrial planet. And other planets like Mars don't have one and that has led to some really big problems. The sun's solar winds would completely strip off our atmosphere. And that's why Mars has only about 1% of the atmosphere that we do here on Earth. That ties into the second shield that we have, which is our ozone layer. So our atmosphere is made up of nitrogen and also about 21% oxygen. And the oxygen that we breathe and we think of as oxygen is actually O2, a diatomic form, an allotrope that has two oxygen molecules bonded. So this is the oxygen that we breathe and that we know and love. Ozone is actually also oxygen, but it is a different allotrope that has three oxygen elements bonded together. Now the ozone layer lives in the region, the stratosphere between nine and 18 miles or 15 to 30 kilometers off the surface of the earth. And what it does is it blocks ultraviolet light. So infrared is lower energy, then we have the visible light spectrum, and then we have ultraviolet light. Now, the higher the energy, the more potentially damaging it could be, all the way up to gamma rays, which are really destructive. So even within ultraviolet, we have three categories, UVA, B, and C. UVA actually does reach us here on Earth, and that's what causes aging. UVB is what causes sunburns, a little bit higher energy, and the ozone layer does block some B, but it blocks almost all of the UVC. And that's really important because marine life, plants even, humans, a lot of life on Earth would be very detrimentally impacted if the UVC from the sun actually reached us. But thanks to our ozone layer, it doesn't. So how do these CFCs and other ozone destructive materials do damage to it? Well, as we mentioned, we've been using it in aerosols and in refrigerants, and it's okay on the surface. It's actually pretty safe and inert. But when it rises into the atmosphere, when ultraviolet light hits it, it breaks off the chlorine, and just one chlorine atom can destroy up to 100,000 ozone molecules. And that's the problem. As these things are introduced into the world, the number of people using these products increases, it goes up, it's destroying the ozone layer faster than it can rebuild, and as a result, we have a big hole, especially in Antarctica. So then the ozone layer is as critical to life on Earth as the food we eat or the water we drink. And if you've bought food recently, you know just how high the prices have gotten. And it's not just food, but most other necessities like fuel, energy, used cars. Even if you're making six figures nowadays, chances are there's nothing left for saving after paying off expenses. Even if you made all the right choices, years like 2022 force you to reassess your entire financial strategy which is why over the last year, major money managers are revamping theirs. 
Shifting from your typical stock and bond portfolios to heavier allocations into alternative assets, exclusive luxury assets like fine art. Historically, art investments would take millions of dollars, but today's sponsor Masterworks allows you to invest in art from legends like Picasso, Banksy, and Monet for a fraction of the price. Thus far, Masterworks has sold over $45 million worth of art and distributed the net proceeds to investors. In fact, each of their sales so far have delivered positive net returns to investors, which is why over 700,000 people have signed up so far. With inflation still hovering around record highs, demand for Masterworks is increasing, so there may be a wait list. But my viewers can skip the line at the link in the description. So add fine art to your investment portfolio today with Masterworks. Huge thanks to Masterworks and you for supporting the show. So the first actions were taken in 1985 at the Vienna Convention for the protection of the ozone layer. And this would create a framework of how we would tackle this as a nation, as a world, to reduce the chlorofluorocarbons and other destructive materials from breaking down the ozone layer. Then two years later, the Montreal Protocol was established. Now this is really what had the enforcement component. It wasn't just a framework. Now we knew how we would phase out materials and switch to using less harmful stuff for aerosols and for refrigerants. And the most amazing part is that every country on earth signed on to follow suit and to abide by these rules. This is the only time in the history of the UN that the entire world ratified a treaty universally. In just 14 years, 1973 to 1987, we went from identifying a problem, figuring out how we could solve it, alternate materials that could do the same things without being as harmful, and made the change and did the Montreal Protocol in 1987. Truly amazing stuff. So, problem solved, we're good, ozone's back, everything's okay. Not exactly, because even if we continue on with the Montreal Protocol and we continue to ban the use of things that could harm the ozone, most scientists believe it'll be around 2040 before the ozone returns to most parts of the world, and it'll be the 2060s before it entirely recovers over Antarctica. Another reason why the ozone layer doesn't get talked about more is because it's complicated. Like for example, why is the hole over the Antarctic? That's not where the chemicals are being released. These chemicals that get released as they approach the equator, they get sucked into the polar vortex and pulled down closer to the poles, especially the South Pole, where it's colder. When you have the perfect combination of cold weather, which means more ice crystals in the clouds, combined with these chemicals, you have further ozone depletion. And so while we are improving, you can tell that the ozone layer is recovering. It's not linear and gradual. There are ups and downs. For example, 2020 was kind of a record year because of colder weather over the poles. But you gotta remember that these chemicals that we released, even though we banned them and stopped releasing them further, they are still in the atmosphere and they will continue to be there for decades to come. Just in a few decades, we did so much damage that it's going to be nearly 50, 60 years to recover. But the earth can recover. And the reason why is oxygen, O2, as it's hit by UV light, often will break up and it can go and form more ozone. So ozone regenerates naturally. As long as we don't destroy it quickly and it regenerates, we'll be Okay, now let's talk about why all this matters. First of all, can we take a moment to celebrate that for once, maybe the only time, hopefully the last time, we came together as a planet to figure things out, that we listened to scientists and we made decisions to move on, to still have air conditioning, but do so in a more sustainable way. This is an amazing story and I hope it gives you a little bit of optimism that we can solve some of the other challenges of our time. Things like the overuse of plastic that don't biodegrade and are littering our planet and our oceans. Or how about decarbonization? It's not all good news though, right? Because the one thing that we had working for us is there wasn't a big lobby. It, there wasn't like a CFC lobby that was fighting tooth and nail to prevent any change from happening. No, not, not at all. People were completely content to move on, right? If you made refrigerators or air conditioners, you just moved from using harmful materials to more environmentally friendly refrigerants. It's not gonna be quite so rosy for every situation. For example, decarbonization and removing a reliance on fossil fuels, natural gas, oil, gasoline, that will be trickier because there are billions and billions, trillions of dollars at stake. Companies that make money selling oil and gas are not gonna wanna give that up because they have a customer for life as long as you own an internal combustion engine car. And that's why the uptake of EVs has taken a while, but we are entering an age where we can make that transition. So if you follow the money a little bit, you can kind of tell which industries are easier to change and which ones are gonna be more difficult. But if nothing else, at least we now know we can solve big problems. I don't think it's too late. I think we can turn things around. The earth will heal. If for 100,000 years, all mankind just turned to stone, the earth would be 
humming and hawing as healthy as can be. The problem is not cutting down trees to make paper. The key to all things in engineering is sustainability. Because if you plant trees and you cut trees at an even rate, then the net zero is actually pretty neutral. And don't forget, trees are big carbon sinks. They capture carbon dioxide from the air and hold it. So if you go build a table out of it, you're actually taking carbon dioxide and converting it into furniture. I know I was shocked to hear just how far we've come and why doesn't the media cover this more? When it was doom and gloom and we're all gonna die from skin cancer, it made the news. And then when all the scientists and the politicians of the world came together and solved it, Ah, okay, we're moving on. What's the next outrage story? And that part frustrates me. I think it's important to celebrate the victories. And this was unilaterally a major, major victory. And I think it should give us all a little bit of optimism. And if you think that's uplifting and amazing, check out this video next.